The Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show. This one is brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors, who will kindly offer you a 10% discount on your legal fees. LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. It's um, really kind of a minute, that. What? Yeah. The offer. Yeah. Is that new? <laughs> it might be. I think you're probably the best look at the website for details of what it entails. Cool. What sort of thing do they do? <laughs> or range of legal services. Um, do they do wills? The good ones. Um, let's have a quick look. Wills. Yes. Probate. Um, Good checking yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Conveyancing. Spell that for me. You know, you know. Begins with a B. I'm, I'm going to say they do. Begins with a C, doesn't it? Yes, uh, they do do conveyance. They do wills, they do probate, they conve- do conveyance, and they do dispute resolution, professional negligence. Mm. Should we talk about the accounts? Well, no, that, that sounds like you're accusing the accountants of professional negligence. <laughs> no. um, which is which I want to say very much for the record. <laughs> I am not. Victor Auto, rather. Um, we have got into the accounts somewhat with uh, with Phil on this week's show, which is coming out on Friday. So look out for that. We're going to talk about Stuart Dallas as well in this one. Um, but again, we've got into the, uh, some Stuart Dallas with Phil. Look out for there's going to be a special show. I think we'll bring that one out on Saturday, all being well. Um, just chatting about Dallas a little bit more extensively and, and his retirement. Just to type the Levi's thing. Oh, yeah. Leviceslicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball to get your 10% discount on your legal fees. For you all- thought you'd skip that part of the podcast. It's back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Forward 30 seconds. No, 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 I'm gonna, no. I'm going to mention it every, roughly every minute from now on. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So if you want to. Uh, if you want to check those out, please do. Help support us and so on and so forth. Uh, Rob's back from your holiday. Did you enjoy your holiday? You went to Naples, didn't you? I bet you're having a really nice time absorbing all that culture, uh, going to see the, the what do they have in Naples? Uh, I don't know. We were only there one night and I spent it watching Leeds Sunderland. So, uh, yeah, it was a great city. I would recommend. Very good. What sort of a, um, an environment were you in? Any of the Leeds fans or was it a disinterested I, bunch you know of locals? I kept thinking that uh, you always see a Leeds fan on holiday, don't mm. you? And didn't see one the whole time. They were hiding. Wow, right. disappointing. You, you did well to find somewhere showing it. No, no, I was uh, just watching it in the Airbnb. Oh, okay, oh, that makes Paid sense. Paid for LUTV. I so you wait, so you wait. When you go into a bar, saying, can you turn this Champions League nonsense off? So yeah. like a big you game went, in the Champo. Went to Naples for one night and you stayed in the Airbnb watching LUTV, Leeds versus Sunderland. Basically, yeah. We were out through the day and then, because we the Coventry game, just avoided it, but then just ended up checking my phone all afternoon and it was kind of worse than watching it. So when it came around to the Sunderland game, I just thought, no, that's it. Holiday's over. This is how it's ending. <laughs> Much sadness. Did you enjoy uh, it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was an awful game, wasn't it? Yeah. I must admit, not being in Ellen Road helped because I didn't have mm. the... I knew how awfully tense it would be. Um, but yeah, it was also helped by the other results. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. we... Um, we didn't know about, did we, the Ipswich game when we recorded the other night and we were all sad about it, but yeah. it turns out that's shit too. But so. we did, no, we did, we did caveat, I'm fairly sure, on the match ball by saying, like, you know, it, it's clear that other teams are going to wobble and drop points in this run-in and lo and behold, that Finnish club, the old Suffolk tractors, mm. finished. Well, so it seems, yeah. I was both losing completely winnable home games. Yeah. <laughs> Leicester losing against, away admittedly, at relegation, threatened Millwall. It's a daft league, isn't it? I must admit, I, I was sort of promising myself not to watch the Ipswich game. And then I would, again, just kept looking at my phone. It got to half time and I saw the stats that Ipswich had, had loads more shots. And I was like, right, just ignore this. But then the entire second half, I was just checking the sofa score momentum graph. I watched the whole game, Rob. I watched yeah. the whole game. But I saw Watford were coming back into it. And I was half tempted to start watching it then. But I thought, well, no, I don't want to jinx it now. Because if I've not watched it to this far and I start watching it, it might somehow change something. Mm. So I just ignored it again. It's ridiculous. About halfway through that second half, I thought, this is going to be nil-nil, this. And I, and I knew within myself it was going to be nil-nil. But then I start, you, know, you start to self-doubt, don't you? There's the, there's the two parts you're playing off against mm. each other going, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. They'll get that late goal because they always do because you're cursed. Yeah, I always tell myself off now for just thinking those things. It's like, oh, no, you thought it. You fucked it. I, I tell myself not to verbalise it at least. Mm. The amount of people report who report superstitions to me down at the tunnel as well. People be like, I'm wearing your shirt again because we've not, not, le- not lost since I've been wearing this shirt. Or people go, I need to go. I'm going to go for a, a pint in the peacock now because I did that against so-and-so and we won that game. So I'm going to keep doing that. It's like your lucky socks, isn't it? Yeah. There's like just a, about 100,000 people probably in total doing stupid things. Just saying in the office before and weren't we before we came in to start recording, what if all this genuinely did affect it? Like, you know, because you, you know it's silly. Mm. But you kind of convince yourself otherwise, don't you? Because you just you want to feel like you've got some sort of agency over the outcome. Mm. 
what if it actually genuinely was the case that all these different things, that perhaps there's a sweet spot, an absolutely perfect set of circumstances, that person needs to go in the peacock. Rob needs to not watch something on his phone on any given particular day on Sky Go. You know, I need to wear my green socks. Mm. It doesn't affect it, does it? No. I think we should start recording immediately and go pissing on four corners of Ellen Road just to test it out. <laughs> yeah. Could work. I did it in the studio earlier. I don't know if you can smell <laughs> it. what that was. <laughs> yeah. Asparagus for tea, lovely <laughs> stuff. I wonder why my eyes were watering uh, there, uh, Michael. But yeah, it's, it's all as you were, basically, isn't it? We've gained a point on Leicester. Could have been worse, all things considered. Could have been so much better. But yeah, you, it feels like we've got away with one as opposed to um, missing an opportunity somehow. I think because we played in the middle. If we'd have played last night, it'd have felt like a missed opportunity. But because the Leicester game was going on during hours and then the other one happened afterwards, it somehow feels better to me. It's yeah. entirely psychological, I realise. I've also accepted that basically since we've come back from the international break, it's just going to be awful until mm. the end of the season. And hopefully I'll be happy by the end of it, but maybe not, but then at least it'll be all over. I do, I do think back to the end of that League One season where there were, de- there were really good bits to it, but then in the end it was like we could have gone up at Charlton and we fucked that up and there were, there were bits where, a bit early in that where it looked like we definitely messed it up. Then we string a few sort of slightly scrappy wins together it was like Richard Naylor scoring a couple at Yeovil and stuff like that Got slightly weird stuff going on in that run mm. and then it comes to the final day and I almost died so uh, <laughs> let's hope it's the same again so just looking somebody uh, worked out I think I saw and I've got the I've got the games in front of me by day and there are one two three four five six seven eight nine so there are ten now there are ten separate dates between now and the end of the season on which a football match is happening that we've got to keep an eye on. And that's if you exclude Southampton. Mm. If you include them there's them as well, there's probably going to be another one. I'm sort of still including them because they've got they could still get to ninety six points. Oh, just for my for my own well being. I've just ignored them. <laughs> <laughs> They're only a, a peripheral concern. And you know, if they do get ninety six points and we don't, then we've messed up, haven't we? Frankly. They've um you know, it's been it's the anchors will have been ours rather than watching them because it means we need to drop quite a lot of points still. So. Mm. Well, it all, it all carries on for another few weeks. So we'll, we'll miss it, won't we? We'll be, we'll be clucking like junkies who've been denied their fix after all this is over after this season. Because it hasn't really been particularly stressful until, it's, as you were saying like this week, Michael, until it started to properly matter until we get to this point of the season now. It was Farkas' fault for saying we could look now. He should have said, "Don't look until there are five minutes of the final game left." And I might have been—I might have been on board with it. I might have been like, "Oh, no, it's, it's good, good thinking, actually, isn't it?" And we'll all be in Ellen Road and can't get a signal anyway, so it'd be fine. <laughs> um, let's take a left turn then and um, talk about Stuart Dallas because he has announced his retirement. It was on the anniversary of the um, the Man City goal that that happened um, in a bit of quite poignant timing. Um, as I was saying, we've done we've done a show with um, with Phil that's going to come out Saturday where we talk a little bit more about Stuart Dallas about kind of the injury. Uh, but in terms of how this this feels, something I said on that show is that it's it's another part, another piece of the jigsaw and a major piece. Um, in the, it's one of the corners of the jigsaw from the Bielsa team that has, um, has now stopped and has, uh, and, and well, well, he'll, he'll go away in a playing capacity, won't he? I guess there was always that hope that one day he might, we might see him back out there and there's a beautiful redemption story, but sadly it's not to be. We could have used him so much this year as well. It's, it is a shame for... That we've ha- we've not had two years of Stuart Dallas the footballer because he was he was brilliant wasn't he up to that injury and yeah the the kind of the years from the that Derby playoff which was ultimately a disastrous evening but that was like he'd been decent that season but that night it was like someone flicked a switch and it was like no he's now one of your best players and he just stayed that until he got injured yeah it, it, that first Bielsa season it wasn't really clear where he fit in and then from that game onwards it was like doesn't matter where he fits in he's just mm. in the team. And I was looking back at uh, what I wrote after he got injured and there was a stat in there that of Leeds' last 122 games at that point, he'd started 121 of them. And he was doing that playing through, the, there was a joke among the players that he could never finish a week of training because his toe was knackered and he mm-hmm. had hamstring strains and various other injuries. And bearing in mind, so much of that was under Bielsa who demanded his players to be sort of ridiculously fit. Dallas was just so resilient and so stubborn he was just like, I don't care. I'm going to be one of the best 11 players in murder ball every week and one of the best players in the every game, basically, every week. It was, uh, yeah, he was just Mr. Consistent, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, he was Mr. 7 out, out of 10 every week without fail. Mm. And 
often more. Yeah. We, are, we should say we are going to do a, a separate guide episode about Dallas at some point, aren't we? Because there's yeah. plenty of stuff, like individual games and moments and stuff to pick out from his, his I mean, any ex- career as any well. Any excuse for me to talk about that Stoke goal um, where Forshaw lays it off to Pablo who mm. rolls it into his path. That, for me, is probably my favourite non non headline goal if you know what I mean like mm-hmm. so the Swansea one for example will always encapsulate that Bielsa season and the moment we thought bloody hell we're going to do this but that and Hull away as well though that big sweeping move that mm-hmm. gets played that was it Tyler Adams who, uh, Tyler Adams Ty, um, I'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Roberts finished off Moscow would kill me if he was here um, yeah Tyler Roberts finished off but that to me I think that's one of my favourite mm-hmm. favourite favourite Leeds goals but so the opportunity to talk about that again I don't even know what it. the score was at that point I mean, was that the second goal out of a 3 0 win? Yeah, I think it was not even a particularly significant goal, but it was just one that you kind of go, oh, oh. There were lots of uh, there were lots of that in the Bale so era, weren't there? The goals that made you just make a little noise when you yeah. when you saw them the first time and you saw a replay and you were like, I think that's even better than I it's, first appreciated. Do you know, it's funny. Do you agree, Michael, that the atmosphere on Tuesday uh, against Sunderland it was the first time I sat in Ellen Road for a while and thought, yeah, this is a proper. We're still in the shadow of the of the Bale era. We're still we're still else's widows aren't we mm. because people wanted us to bomb forward and commit bodies and just break this down no matter what keep knocking on the door and we were knocking on the door but just not not quite enough but then there's always a bit of a desire for the other as well because there were definitely games in the Bielsa where Ali Oski would appear in the box and we'd be leading by a goal and he's the 93rd minute and he's up there and you think for fuck's sake just sit back yeah. let, let a winger run it into the corner and just hold on to it down there and we'll just see this game out and then we'd still be trying to add more goals so mm. There's um you know there's always a bit of a bit of rose tinted yeah, nostalgia about. I, I stuff, didn't necessarily it? mean it as like one thing is better than the other, but but in t- well in terms of the all out attacking, that's better in the sense that it's it's more fun to watch because yeah. it's it can be reckless at times, can't it? So why the hell not? It's like it's rock and roll football, but um yeah, just I don't know. It was, it was just an an awareness, a situational awareness, I suppose, where I thought, yeah, this is this kind of uh, the annoyance at the at the backwards passing and the negative perceived mm-hmm. negative football is because we still hanker after that kind of that all out mm. attack I was, I was going to say on Dallas in terms of his moments rather than a moment I felt like there was just two years where everything he did he just did it right mm. even if it was just really simple things like his touch or a tackle or a pass like a game would go by where everything he did I'd just be like well well done Dallas well in Dallas because he, he just whatever it was it was the right decision and he did it properly and I think everything that's come since then where we've watched Rasmus Christensen try and pass a ball or take a throw in and just really struggle to mm. do it. You just think, oh, I just miss Stuart Dallas so much. A guy who you can just trust to do things right and mm. properly. It's an excellent point, is that, you know? It really is an excellent point. Like, you, the, you see the difference between good and great players and more mediocre ones. It's all about decision-making, isn't it? And it felt like almost every footballing decision we took during that era felt like it was correct, even if it wasn't. Because mm. the thing with Dallas is you'd almost struggle to pick out what he was brilliant at like with Pablo you'd say oh, he could he could see passes no one else could see he could he could hit passes other people couldn't Calvin had the big diagonal ball Dallas was just good he just made just made good decisions and was in the right place and that was really his, well, his saying, strength it, during that period it felt like they all did more often than not it's mm. very rare that you, you looked and you got you got annoyed at what a stupid decision we'd made mm. it's why he could play everywhere as well and one of my favorite Leeds goals from that time was um I think it's Bamford's hat-trick goal at Villa and it felt like there was just like two or three minutes leading up to that where, again, we did everything right. And if ever Villa dared to touch the ball, we just go, no, we're having that. Mm. And we just carry on doing brilliant things. And it ended with a ridiculous finish. And yeah, Dallas was just always the heartbeat of everything. Oh, Rob, you've made me feel <laughs> I, I mean, we, we just keep having this, don't we? Whether it was like the ailing videos that weren't that long ago, were they? When you just get to look back at it all. And it's all, it's all quite bittersweet as well, isn't it? Because you see the... I mean, Dallas himself addressed it, but you see the Man City goal, and it was a great moment. And I remember us like going mad celebrating it, watching it. But it's in front of an empty stadium, and you didn't get to, you didn't get to, people didn't get to enjoy it there. You didn't get to see the sad Man City faces as that rolls into the net. You didn't get to, I don't know, you didn't get to see them lifting the trophy in front of a crowd and stuff like. There's so much of that era that was brilliant, and then so much of it that's tinged with a lot of sadness as well. Yeah, so, yeah. It's just I suppose that's the way football is for I the most yeah, part. Isn't yeah, it, it is, isn't it? Because it's it, well, it's based on sentimentality so much of it, isn't it? And that that is one of yeah again rather than like a personal regret for me not getting to see the trophy lift and games inside, inside stadiums will be yeah, yeah Bielsa himself not getting the moment with the trophy in front of the crowd mm. to salute him for what he'd done. 
because he probably wouldn't think he was worthy of it anyway. But uh, he bloody well was, wasn't he? And yeah, Stuart Dallas, an absolute core part of that. Um, right, let's talk about money very quickly. And it, again, we don't need to go too detailed into this because the accounts have been released. But we are seeing probably the the legacy left behind of trying to get established in the Premier League following that that promotion. And it ain't looked too pretty, does it? <laughs> I'm not saying it's disastrous or we're in any sort of big trouble, but as, we, as we've said with, with the show with Phil, which again will be out tomorrow, um, it shows that if we don't go up, sales will happen. And sales still might happen, you never know, mm. you know, to, to balance the books. When you're in the Premier League, you just end up spending all of your money and more. Just as when you're in the Championship, you end up spending all of your money and more. I'm not sure at what point you don't have to do that. But um, yeah, I think in the gist of it seems to be that these aren't a disastrous set of accounts because the bar for accounts is now so absolutely awful that you kind of, you go, oh, well, at least we're not spending like, you know, 200% of turnover on wages. That's good. <laughs> that's kind of, that's almost where we are with stuff. And it seems like the profit and sustainability stuff were just about still on the right side of it. And looking forward, we have probably enough good players to be able to sell them, which is in itself quite depressing. But if we need to, we, there's there's enough talent there, isn't there, that we can we can continue to make, it's like make ends meet on these things, I suppose. Whereas when we came down, Risdale era, we came down with basically no one left to sell. We sold a few players and, and then... The market collapsed, didn't it? And then we're sort of stuck with salaries of Seth Johnson, Gary Kelly, Lucas Radaby, people who'd been good servants to the club in a lot of respects, but also were then still stuck on Champions League contracts in the uh, in the championship. So it's not as disastrous as those times, hmm. but... I tell you what it has done, though. Let's just go up, eh? It has shed a little bit of light on what's happening this season because these accounts finish summer 2023 so we get relegated and these accounts run up to the end of that season so June the 30th um, the I suppose the perceived clearing of the decks that seems to have happened you know this season since the the new regime's come in they've got a lot going on on the football side Nick Hammond and Steinson and all that um, that they you know the, the, the sold yelled at. I, I get a feeling that we're going to see quite a clearing of the decks one way or another this coming summer anyway mm. I think we we won't see Aronson coming back probably. Actually, I originally thought he might. I suspect they'll try and offload him in some capacity. I think we'll you know as the Shackleton goes, Pervade is gone, and we'll be going. Mm. Um, you've got the the core parts of that promotion side: Ailing, Cooper, Dallas, all on fairly sizable contracts. If we go up, you imagine they try and move Furpo on, and it, it feels like they just kind of almost said, "Look, we need to tidy up all the mess and the excess that happened during Victor Orta's." time at Leeds and that, you know that's not to say that we could have avoided doing what we we're doing but it felt like we've, we've chucked a lot of money at, at not very good players <laughs> yeah it, it was not it was, to mention all the loan rats I was going to say was the other point like all the ones who are out on loan you know Christensen, Rocker all those lot I mean the worry for them is is there even going to be a market for them because so many of them have left and continued surprise surprise being crap footballers but uh, it was interesting the timing of this coming on the day that Dallas reti- retired you know this guy who we signed for one and a half million quid or whatever from Brentford. And, you know, the one thing that the previous ownership got right in hiring Bielsa and he took this 1.5 million winger from Brentford to scoring the winning goals at Man City. And then in that time, that ownership had all that time to learn. And yet they seemed to come out of it thinking they were the cleverest people in the room. They spent the best part of 200 million quid getting us relegated. And now you look mm. at these accounts and go, shit, that's a lot of money, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But then you, again, you look at the the sort of backroom team that's been put in place there now like you know, Robbie Evans for example who's come in as chief strategy officer will no doubt be working out presumably with the aid of data imagine that I know it would really really upset Neil Warnock who doesn't like data Victor, come, Victor Alter had a spreadsheet come on now. well Victor had his spreadsheet and he had Y Scout and Neil Warnock he, he don't like he don't like it how they're just bringing all those lads over the continent <laughs> based on data you know, they brought data in haven't they um, but I you know data is the way that it's going and if there is a way to give yourself always marginal gains in sport isn't it if you can get those marginal gains to try and give yourself a little advantage. Well, in the way that, for example, Brighton have their, they've got a patented algorithm, haven't they, when mm-hmm. it comes to recruitment and managers and so on and so forth. So, and that belongs to, I think it's Tony Bloom who holds that, doesn't mm-hmm. it, who owns the club. So they can fall back on that to an extent and it's having them overperform probably where they, you, I say should be, I'm doing again air quotes, but um, it, it's a means to try and tap into that same idea, I suppose. Mm. I think the thing is for most clubs in the Premier League, the reality is if you make a few bad signings and a 
couple of bad managerial appointments, you're in quite a lot of shit yeah. pretty quickly. What I'm saying is it feels like they're trying to mitigate against that mm. and make sure they don't make those mistakes so you can afford to make, if you don't quite get one thing right, that you've not pissed a load, load of money up off the, mm. you know, up the wall, you maybe go for those slightly more sensible signings, you might retain some resale value. That con- although in you know, some cont- ways, though, Contrast with the moonshot of bloody John Kevin Augustin. Although in some ways, the likes of Rocker and Christensen looked like that because they weren't huge investments in terms of cash. They'd played at reasonable levels. They'd... Certainly, Christensen had played internationally. It seemed those seemed in some way sensible. Yeah, but Rocker, you can see, is completely immobile as a footballer, and that's probably why he was available. You know, and and so we've got a team that like so Bielsa was obviously very very high pressing. Marsh's football was all out running around like a headless chicken pressing, and you wonder how much of that was Victor Orta wanting to prove a point that I could take this player from Bayern Munich and we can put him into our team mm-hmm. and make him work. It didn't, did it? <laughs> <laughs> Is the short bit? How's how's Victor doing in Spain now? Have they improved at all? Uh, severe. I've not, I've not been checking in on them I recently. Think, yeah, slightly. I think they're like fifteenth or something now. Yeah. Well done, Victor. Well I think that are they like pining for a takeover by those people who are really not taking over Everton because they're. Oh mess. God, is it them? I think they're, they're yeah, they're around. sort of seven, seven, seven. Yeah, around there, I think. Right. Yeah, Which I'm sure will go great. That'll go. I was going to say that'll go well. So mm. they are thirty games into the season, uh, so they've got eight to go. They are on 31 points in 14th spot with Caddies, who are 18th on 25. So they've got a six-point gap. So chances are they'll probably be all right. Because Victor Caddy... Alt's seen fit to bowl in anyone's face, who's, uh, who's dead to <laughs> express a bit of should, displeasure at the way say, it's going. Should we say probably? Let's say probably. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, like, Cadiz have only won four games all season. Granada, who are underneath Cadiz, two games. Yeah. Um, Almeria, who are bottom on 13 points and uh, 15 points adrift. Probably not going to do much. It's a low bar then. Yeah, is what you say. It, it was. I think it was last month. Uh, Sevilla fans were kind of wondering why the three players Otter had signed in January hadn't really played, and they'd been saved by a kid who was playing for like their third team at the start of the year. But, you know, I'm sure that was another Otter masterstroke. Because he's got that lad from he got that lad from Manu on loan, didn't he? Um, is it Hannibal? Mm. And who, who the, he got dropped within weeks for being basically a knobhead. I think is the <laughs> is the the fans' way to put it. Learn from the best, I suppose, yeah. at Man United. Yeah. Some, some good role models there. The captain, for example. Absolutely, yeah. Well, great bunch of lads, aren't they? Great bunch of lads. Um, player of the Year, you looking forward to that? That's happening. It's a week today as we record this Thursday, the 18th of April. Michael, those, those tickets, silver tickets, £120, including that. So that's fine. That's good. Gold tickets, 150 They don't seem to have mentioned the platinum tickets, which you can get if you, if you go and have a look. Do you want to know how much they are? Have oh, a guess. No. Let's, have a, let's have a game of, let's see how much we can upset Michael. What do you get for a platinum ticket? Ah, uh, I probably Cause want. For, cause I'd, for, I'd want Daniel Farker sat on my knee for that. A gold ticket, one hundred and fifty quid. I was thinking that's got to be free bar. It is not a free bar. No access, a, access to a cash bar though. Oh, ca- cashless bar. In oh, fact. cashless. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you for giving me access to. So you don't even have to bring your wallet. <laughs> a bar where I can spend. Unless, unless a cashless bar means it's free, which I don't think is right. Yeah. What does that mean for you? Cashless bar? means you've got to pay with your card. Right, that is what it means. Yeah, you, know, you can't tell your yourself. phone or your watch or whatever. But, <laughs> I've uh, misunderstood and I'm not willing to. <laughs> Listen, there's been a, a terrible <laughs> a terrible misunderstanding. I need to go now. Uh, yeah, 120 quid. Well, actually, if you if you get the tickets online. At, I think um, it, basically the gold ticket is if you want a table where you can see what's going on, I right. think. And the silver tickets, you're at the edge. Yeah, well, your silver tickets are £120 plus £1 booking fee, which I think is obviously quite reasonable. Needed. Um, Gold is £151, including the booking fee. Platinum, where, like I say, presumably you get Daniel Farker sat on your lap. Um, £300. 300, 301 quid if you include uh, the booking fee. But you ca- you can't talk to them. You can't get photos. <laughs> yeah, you I mean, can you even look at them? No one has to go, do they, I suppose, is the thing. It is expensive. No, t- um, It's like no touching, eye contact only. But yeah, they've made that sound really joyless, haven't they? <laughs> there will not be an opportunity to have photos with players or ask for autographs during the evening. If you see them in the toilets, don't fucking speak to them. Yeah. Don't even look at them yeah. at all. Eyes front and centre, as it should be at the urinals. <laughs> they have, have special urinals. There was, def- there was definitely um, a Player of the Year awards when Sol Bamba was singing songs in the toilet. Mm-hmm. I remember there being videos of that. And there was uh, Ross McCormack got levered that time, didn't he? It? Did. <laughs> it was good. But yeah, it's been a while since we've actually had a Player of the Year awards, isn't it? So mm. maybe they've just forgotten how they work. Um, we'll, true, we'll have a look at... Um, Who are you voting for, by the way? Well, I was going to say, let's save it for when we get into Heroes and Villains in a Fair bit enough. and uh, and see where the, where the scores are pointing us, but it's going to be one of... Uh, Jeeth and Rompadu, is it? One of the two? Yeah, one of the two, probably. Yeah. And I suspect Archie might win Young Player of the Year, just as a... <laughs> just as an out, If you're a betting man, 
Mm. I think that might be worth a, worth a couple of quid. Let's just hope they're going to live stream this and we can we can all feel like we're there. You've got to pay like a tenner to watch the live stream, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> through LUTV. Yeah. Do it through a VPN. <laughs> <laughs> what, sorry, how does that work? Don't know. No, <laughs> just, just something you've heard about. Um, yeah, so anything else to address then from the, from the news? What else has been going on? Fill me in. Um, the under-18s have done well. We've yep. reached a final. Managed to beat Millwall at Ellen Road in a, a bit of a back and forth 4-3. Forth that was good fun. Um, I watched most of it while it was kind of putting getting kids to bed and stuff. So I was kind of had it on in, on my phone while um, while other stuff was going on. Your own? My own children. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Um, but yeah, it was... Uh, Good win, and we now play Man City on a date which seems to not quite be confirmed. It was originally okay. seemed to be in for the fourth, but then some stuff I've read. That's seems, the last day of the season. Yeah, some stuff seems to be saying they might rethink that. Yeah, I um, think yeah, because I mean, yeah, and I think it was initially <laughs> because it, it's at Man City because it's it's not a two legged thing anymore or, or a neutral venue, and it's fixed. Um, obviously against it's, it's the new leads were coming, so they fixed it. Um, mm. but they. <laughs> It was originally due to be at their academy stadium, but as it's us in Man City, I don't know if they might end up moving it to the proper stadium. They should move it to Oldham, play on a neutral ground in the middle. On a really shit pitch. Yeah. <laughs> give on, these, they should reinstall the plastic pitch. Give these young footballers the best chance possible. <laughs> play, uh, play it on some... Of coming out with knee burns. Some absolute shit heap. <laughs> so, yeah. So, well, yeah, good luck to them. They've done well to get there, haven't they? It's nice. To, it, that sort of harks back to my own youth of watching, like, the, the 997 one, and prior to that, is it 1993? Mm which was the one bright spark in the post-championship season um, where we finished 17th, which was bollocks. Uh, well, I, think, I think we'll take a decent number of uh, fans to that. If it's, if, particularly if it's post-season, people will um, get quite into that, I think, one way or another. Definitely. Post, post-season pre-playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> nah. We'll be done by then. We'll be, we'll be finished. We're going to drop out to 7th. <laughs> I actually tweeted after the Sunderland game we're going up as fucking champions and I just had a lot of people telling us to fuck off. <laughs> it's a fair point. It's a fair response. I saw you tweet that. I wondered if you'd been drinking. Yeah, I had. Ah. <laughs> Does explain it. Does explain it. The Square Ball Podcast. 